we go. Good morning, everyone. Julie Boye here. So excited to be with one of my dearest and longest friends, Leanne Jacobs. Good morning, Leanne. Hi, babe. I'm so glad that we're doing this. So uh, Leanne and I have been friends for almost 20 years. <laughs> It's actually going to be 20 years in January that we met. We met through our corporate careers. We have been through so many life uh, changes together. Our journey has been really incredible. What I love about Leanne is she always leads with heart and humility and passion. Um, and I just, you're such a caring and loving person. And when I thought about this whole self-love project, I was like, Leanne is one of those people that I really, really want to connect about it because, you know, these are things that you just all, always do in your life. And well, maybe not when we first met, <laughs> but you've really learned to take care of yourself and to really share that with others. So for those that have not had the chance to meet you yet, could you just share a little bit about how you kind of got where you are today? I don't know if I am anywhere other than on the, uh, the evolutionary spectrum. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think I think if you look at sort of like the day-to-day -day stuff, I can be like, oh yeah, I did this and I tested out this and I did a corporate career entrepreneur. But if you sort of look what's behind that, it's like following our path to <clears throat> true authenticity and our path to living out our dharma, which means the road is bumpy and curvy and all kinds of stuff, but honoring everything that happens. And, and when you talk about the self-love project, I think that's one of the biggest pieces that we have to honor is like when we're not at our best, <clears throat> when we fail, yeah, put out shit work, um, when we eat shit, it's like honoring who we are always is really, it, it's really our path. Right. And, um, I think that's one of the big practices that I have is I do a lot of crazy things. I mean, you know, right? Like some things aren't always the smartest moves, but I'm never hard on myself. Like I might have a moment where I ball, like, like why do you always have to take the difficult path? <laughs> but I also honor that the patterns in our lives have something to do with our dharma, right? So if we keep finding ourselves in the same situation, it's like to, to, to take note. And, and one of the all other things that has been part of my path is becoming more of an observer to what's happening. I've never been somebody who is attached to drama. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, yes, being, being even, um, that's a spiritual practice. Yeah. And I learned that at a young age by studying and mentoring with Carolyn Mace. Um, she really taught me like, you have to live bigger than your body. So if those people that are always in the drama or always like hot and cold, their emotions are all over the place, they're looking at the life, their life so literally and so attached from ego, they can't evolve. So I hope that through my work and through uh, my relationships, that that's something I bring to the world um, without being perfect ever, but trying to support people in having a journey that's much more... Um, connected to the inner light yeah. than living in the drama of Instagram and all that kind of stuff that goes on. Yeah. You definitely don't spend a lot of time in drama. And I know that even when drama occurs, like we've been in business together for it happens. years. It sometimes happens. It sometimes it finds you. Yeah. Uh, it's found me several times, but I feel like how you handle it shows you your evolution. Yeah. And you're really good at like looking at Where's the lesson here? Like, you know, especially when you've been through some, some, you know, I know you've had some legal dramas, you've had some challenges in that way. Yeah. And, <laughs> but it's true. You're really good at like looking at things from a, a perspective of, I love what you said. Like, I never blame myself. Like you're not, that's the thing is you're not hard on yourself in that way, but in another way, you're also like so extremely caring and you have such a big heart but it, you're, there's no blame and there's no, you know, uh, like instead of looking at things as a mistake or a, I shouldn't have done that, you're like, oh, well, here I am. What am I learning? How am I growing? How do I move forward? Because gosh, I mean, like just sometimes, 
sometimes it's hard, you know, like sometimes if you have expectations at, on how somebody should behave towards you, right. Or should respond to an act of kindness. When you have expectations, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Yeah. Right. So that's been a practice that I've done since I was a kid. It's like practicing, never having expectations, but I will say it always hurts a little <laughs> when you get disappointed or somebody um, may respond with non-kindness or in a way that you would never treat another person. So sometimes it, it isn't always easy, right? But I think you learn to, and my husband's great at this. It's like, when you don't have expectations, it's not a negative thing. It's just that you just live from a place of trying to live from a place of unconditional love where you don't have expectations. You're just giving for the sake of giving. Well, and I think a lot of this has changed for you too, now that you are a mom of three beautiful boys and you have a stepdaughter and you, you know, this is the hardest thing I think for parents as well to continue on that self-love journey, to continue on that, the expectations of, am I being a good parent? Am I doing the right thing for my children? And I think that's, again, a, a quality that you have that I really admire is you make difficult choices. You will make a lot of difficult choices in your life, but you never, as far as I know, and I know you pretty well, you're not like saying, well, I'm not a good parent because of this choice. Like you make different choices, but you're still a good person inside. And I think that really links back to self-love. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I don't know that we can reach our highest potential in this lifetime if we don't have self-esteem and self-love because we're always gonna care what people think, right? Yeah. <laughs> and if we live that way, there's, if we live that way, I don't know that we can reach our true dharma. Um, one thing I would encourage people to do is have a practice of not caring about the opinions of others. It's really difficult with social media, right? But unfortunately, like, I don't know, I just, who wants to follow the herd? It's like you have one, one shot at being here and it could have taken a million lifetimes for you to actually manifest on this planet in physical form. Yep. So you don't want to waste your time chasing a messy herd where most people have no clarity, right? So we're following people without direction a lot of the time. Instead of listening to our own true authentic voice and intuition and being bold and courageous, and saying, you know what, like Wayne Dyer says, I don't want to die with the music still in me. And that's going to mean making decisions that other people hate. Oh, that's so good. It's so but true. You know what? Like, oh. Who cares? It's like, oh, that's why I love uh, you so much. Because you are able to just say that. And you, you're saying it like, this is really who you are. You know, a lot of people say these things. That they're not worried about other people's opinions. That they're not thinking about what other people are judging them. And they say that, but you like, you actually, yeah, and it's not, I, I'm not saying it's always easy. Like well, this moved to Huntsville, right? Like I moved up to Muskoka. I wanted to do it four years ago, but there is a little piece of me. It's like, I'm responsible for a husband and four other children. And, and, and I do worry about what my parents are going to think. And so, but I also learned those lessons young in life. Right. Um, so I've been there and it's like, I have to now take what I've learned and put it into practice. That's how wisdom is gained. Right. So I, I have to, it, it's like, it's not like it's always easy, right? but I just feel like, what's the point of being here if you're not going to get it out of your system and, and make choices obviously in the greater good, but that follows your intuitive voice. And in the beginning, sometimes you don't know. It's like, is this my intuition? Is this just brain chatter? Like, I'm not really sure. I get that question a lot. Like, how do you know if it's intuition? Oftentimes, intuition is that initial response, like that, that quick hit that often doesn't make sense. And you're like, did I just hear that? And it keeps coming back. A lot of times people have that in a relationship that possibly isn't working out, right? Like it could be a friendship or a marriage. It's like they know, they know that they're supposed to graduate or evolve or move on, but it's easier and more comfortable to not. So they'll keep getting that <laughs> to nudge 
time and time again. So that's kind of how you know it's like that. In sometimes, if you're hyper and you're excitable, you might get a download that isn't always the smartest. But a true intuitive hit will keep coming back. Well, I th- and I think we both understand that. You know, I mean, that's definitely. I'm divorced. You know, <laughs> that that is. Are? Um, and it was that time, like kept hearing again, like, this is not the right thing. And I knew it for a really long time, but I wasn't able to like do anything about it because everyone around me was getting married and everyone it was that age. And I just, I had a really cool conversation with Lisa Petty, who's doing some really cool work on Gen Xers, us and self-care and self-love and what expectations, you know, of others we had. And I mean, I got married the first time because of that expectation, because I was like, well, I'm like 24, like it's time to get married. And I didn't didn't even realize at the time that that's what was happening in my life, but I was listening to the other voices, but my gut inside knew that this wasn't the right thing. And over time I've become better at listening to that, that intuition and that gut. And uh, you were very good. I mean, you were talking about that nudge to move, you know, four years ago and you just kept listening to it and listening to it. And then you allowed it at, what was really divine timing, right? Sometimes too, you might get that nudge, but it might not quite be the right time. It's sort of, per- there's a percolation period. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's, it's about honoring that and not being impulsive, but just like, why do I keep getting this hit? And like for, for my husband and I, when we did move, it's like tears of appreciation for, it feels so right. It's not that there's not going to be always challenges, even if you pick the right path, right? There's <laughs> going to be lessons, but it's like, it feels yeah. so great. And it's like, you, like it's, there's just such a like exhale. It's like, huh, okay. I wasn't crazy. This was what I was supposed to do, you know? Um, so I think, you know, it's always going to take deep courage, but I believe it's that in my opinion, I mean, and there's, there's really great research by Abraham Maslow on this, on self-actualized people. And the one thing they all have in common, these are like visionary leaders who have changed history. Yeah. They all don't care about the opinions of others. Like none of them did. And if we can't get over that, we really can't lead in our own life. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, a leader, a part of being in leadership is that you, you're not there to please everybody because if you were, then you wouldn't be in leadership. Like right. it's, but it's not easy for women. No. And that's, and it's really interesting. You've been doing some more work um, that I think is kind of leading edge and kind of taking us to the next level around energy management. Mm-hmm. And I just was wondering if you could share a little bit about that, this new work that you're starting to share and, um, you know, speak on. Yeah, well, I think energy management has been sort of a buzz topic for, I think, the last decade. And uh, obviously, the yoga world talks about it all the time in the world of Qigong and and everything. But using ancient methods of managing energy in our everyday life allows us to be in a space where we live in sort of a world of no time. Mm -hmm. So some of you may know somebody, it's like, how does that person get so much done? And all, you know, all these things on their plate, but they still manage to do self-care. And it it seems unbelievable that these certain people, and it's like living in that place of no time. It's kind of that spiritual place. It's a spiritual plane. So it's about how do you get there? And how do you operate like that? So, and one of the things about that, and I'm a firm believer, is that our planet has evolved past time management. And this is really the work I've been doing. Um, I'm not saying this. The Seven Habits is one of my favorite books. And I believe that time management is a basic skill that everybody should learn. But we've graduated past that as a society. And time management excellence will not bring you extraordinary results anymore. It's really about learning how to warp time with specific skills so that you can get to a place where you exponentially evolve. That's, I, it's so mind blowing, but so exciting at the same time. And it's, it is true because time passes differently when we are doing different things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had an, an observation of time yesterday because I went to the beach with my daughter 
And in my head, I was like, this is going to take a really long time to go do this, but I have to do this, right? Like, because it's important for my self-care, my self-love practice. Like, it's sunny. I got to go to the beach because it rains a lot where I live on Vancouver Island. And the whole thing actually only took about maybe 40 minutes, including the drive, all these things. But it was so like in the moment, it felt like a really long time. Like we were at the beach forever, but it was like 20 minutes. That's kind of that place of no time. Yeah. Because we were just there and it was sunny and we were throwing the stick with the dog and I was happy and my daughter was running and she was exploring and it just, it, there is something really magical and special about what you're saying. And I, I do think it's, it's the shift in a conversation away from managing our time to a little bit, I would say maybe allowing time, right? Because it's a construct that we've created that doesn't really exist. That's the challenge. Anyway, this is such, we could get really deep into our existential conversation. Yeah. And, and, and this practice of living like that, um, you know, like a lot of creatives can tap into that yeah. um, quite, not always easily, but when they tap into it, they get into that place of no time. That's when they bust out albums in two yeah. days, you know? That's what I'm talking about. Some people, um, and again, it's very tied to uh, our connection with spirit, our connection with creative flow. Mm-hmm. And But a lot of people, they don't know how to get into that zone, right? Because yeah. that's, not part of, that's not part of our curriculum. That's not part of uh, the mentorship we receive. Yeah. So we often will wake up and we're in business and we're like, oh, like this feels so monotonous or we still will have to do things that require responsibility, but our um, focus will be more on um, creating great things that impact the world in a bigger way. Yeah. Oh, this is so juicy. And I, I, there's so much more we could talk about, but in the essence of, you know, those that are listening and watching, I really want to ask you my favorite question that I ask people that um, I'm connecting with is, when you look at all this beautiful work that you're doing, this direction you're going, how does this connect back to self-love? You know, we've talked about it a little bit, but what does that look like for you even in your own life? I think, um, I mean, Esther Hicks talks about the importance of selfishness. Okay. Um, I think making a commitment to ourselves, what it, whether it's a small commitment or a big commitment, like for, for, some people it's like living in joy is a big commitment or following our bliss is a big commitment. But for some people it's drinking right now. I'm just getting by. It's like drinking water every day is my, commitment. it's holding ourselves accountable to the commitments we make to ourselves. And that's really what I think it's all about. How many times do we make a commitment that we break to ourselves? Oftentimes it's because we're trying to be perfect and do way too many things and blow a fuse, right? So it's like, make a commitment to ourselves that we keep. And if that means it has to be something little, like for you, the beautiful commitment you make to your walks and your, your sunrise walks, that is a spiritual commitment. Yeah. And that's what we need to be able to thrive moving forward. It's spiritual commitments. It's not committed to be on, on social media. Um, we're, we're, we're all as a, as a, as a society, having a deep calling to move from ambition to me, right? Like Carl Jung's work is very important. And the younger generations are doing it in their teens. We, a lot of us, we woke up when we we're 35, 40. Yeah. But these 14 year olds want to, they don't want the ambition part. They want to just go to meaning. And so that's, it's a calling that's way bigger than our personalities. Oh, there's so many amazing things. I kind of wish I was taking notes. Good thing I'm recording this and I can go back and take notes from our chat. I know we kind of do, but we, you know, living on opposite ends of the country now, we don't get to do that. And it's why, which is coming back to a personal, and I'm sure you've already shared this, so it's probably okay that I'm saying it, but like my husband and you have both had near-deathers, right? There's a reason why people who have experienced near-deathers have a, a... a special bond with themselves after it's like there is a commitment to that is deeper than somebody who hasn't gone through that um and i think that's really special so to have as a best friend somebody who's gone through that and as a husband i think has been such a gift not and i'm so grateful you are both here but to to 
be experiencing that because I know Carolyn Mays always said like people who have had near death experiences have an, have a, a different practice. They have a different depth about them that you can't language. So, you know, what's interesting is, um, whenever I like miss you the most, it's like, I think back to those moments when you were there, when I was in the hospital and I mean, I didn't know you were there, but like, I knew you were there and it's, it is that moment of like, you that, like brush your teeth, like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But even just, these are the things that like you mentioned about that and those things like mark you, they do, they mark, there's like a line in my life of the time before I got sick and almost lost my life and the time after, because they are not the same. Yeah. And, you know, I've been on this part of my journey, which is like, I moved across the country. I moved twice in a year. I totally changed the way that I work. I homeschool my child now. And I'm looking for answers in different places now. And this is where this whole project started. And, you know, having people like you in my life that, that understand that and support that has been really helpful, even though it is hard. Like geography makes things challenging for sure, but energetically, you know, I just have to think of you in the moment and you're like right there. So that's amazing. Um, as we wrap up this beautiful chat, I just would love if you could, if you had one thing that you could inspire people, a habit to start, a habit to stop, a, a way of thinking that they can shift, what would that gift be? I would say make the highest priority of your day, your well being. <laughs> because really work and business doesn't yeah. really matter. That is absolutely so, so simple, but actually super important and it's super easy to forget. So, oh, Leanne, I adore you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us today. I, I'm glad I get to share a little piece of what you and I get to do privately with a lot of other people just to hear this incredible the gifts that you have to share, the wisdom that you share, and just your beautiful, sparkly personality. Thank you. Thanks for having me.